This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. With me today is Hans. How are you doing, Hans? Hey, hey. Pretty good. Pretty good. <clears throat> How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. And we have back on the show yet again, we have Mario Cuomo, lead singer of the Orwells. And Hello, we're boys. Talking about the film from John Cassavetes, The Killing of a Chinese Bookie. Uh, Mario, how are you doing today, by the way? Good. I, uh, I'm better now. I think earlier I, like, shoveled myself into a panic attack because I, uh, I was shoveling like a madman. And my heart just started racing like I was going to die. And I had to, uh, I just dropped the shovel and I was like, oh, no, I'm going to pass out. I'm going to pass out in the snow and that's going to be the end of me. And I, uh, I don't know. You guys ever had like uh, any anxiety attack experience? No, but I react the same way every time I do any type of exercise. So I, I feel you. <laughs> yeah, I think my, my body was probably just in shock. I haven't moved a lot, but fuck. That's, I felt weird for a couple hours. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty fortunate. We've had nothing but snow in New York except like the past 48 hours. It just finally stopped, and that seems to be when everybody else is getting snow. Like Texas is freaking out because they get a storm going. Uh, nothing here, luckily. What about in Costa Rica, Hans? You get any snow <laughs> ever? No, it's hot as fuck right now. I just turned off my fan before I started recording, so if you see me sweating... It's not because I'm nervous. But you always <laughs> look sweaty, Hans. Disgusting here. Well, I'm always here, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I wanted to get the background uh, to be the, the Chinese bookie's ass when he's walking out of the pool. I couldn't find a screen cap of that, though, unfortunately. I should have downloaded the movie ahead of time. <laughs> Damn. Uh, so we're, we are talking about this movie, The Killing of a Chinese Bookie. When we originally did the show on Maniac... Mario, I believe you gave like a short list, and this was one of the films on that list. And uh, Cassavetes is a filmmaker that I got into, well, I tried getting into his work back in like 2010, maybe 2009. Mm -hmm. And, you yeah. know, like 19, 20 years old, it's very difficult to find his movies accessible or enjoyable just because of how dry they can be and yeah, how totally. long a lot of the takes are. Uh, but this was one that I remember was on Netflix back in the day before it became like Bollywood movies and uh, Nigerian know. dramas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I put it on. I was just like, I, I was so zonked out trying to get through this movie. I watched it again last year. I watched the 76 version and I thought that was pretty good. Kind of slow. I watched the 78 version recently and uh, my opinion of it is dramatically higher. I mean, I, I liked it to begin with, but I really, really enjoyed the 1978 version. Just, so just before we get into the movie itself, uh, which version of the film did you guys wind up watching? Both or one or the other? Um, I first saw the longer one, and then a few days ago watched the uh, shorter version, and I did, uh, I did like it a little bit more just because... It, it was a long movie, and, uh, you know, it's kind of slow. I could only find the 76 one. I'm not sure which one of the two that is, but uh, it didn't really feel slow to me at all, which it's weird because whenever I thought this was slow, I don't miss it. No, no, not at all. I was really engaged. I think I just like the Cosmo character too much. I wanted to see him fail. I just wanted to see what the next thing he was going to do to fuck up trying to look cool. So I was really invested in this character, and it, it never really felt slow to me. What a fuck up! What a <laughs> amazing fuck up! Uh, this this is kind of like the prototype of uncut gems. A bit, yeah. His character has a compulsion to gamble to try and do the double or nothing deal when he's like literally just come back to even, um, and of course just succumbs to his own flaws in the end, which is you know, the basis of the movie. And, uh, you know, th this is, it's not my favorite Cassavetes film. It's probably my second favorite after Husbands. There are so many good character actors in this. You have Timothy Carey in your background. He is excellent in this movie. He's also in Minnie and yeah. Moskowitz. And I think the role he's probably most known for is playing one of the uh, three soldiers selected for um, execution for, for court-martialing over cowardice in Paths of Glory, the Stanley Kubrick film, where he wound up getting fired because he was so difficult to work with. He kept trying to do his own thing while acting, and that really pissed off Kubrick. Um, 
one of the things that I noted between the uh, 76 cut, which you watched, Hans, and the 78 cut, was that it seemed like they chopped down a lot of the stage sequences. Uh, seemed to be less of an emphasis on the club and the dancers and Cosmo's nightlife. Uh, and more, the plot just seemed a little bit more refined, a little tightened uh, by comparison. Uh, Mario, did you have a preference between these two? Did you? I mean, Hans is saying that it wasn't slow for him, which is uh, <laughs> shocking for me. Um, did you note any like real significant dif- uh, difference in your intaking of the movie? Not so much. When you said uh, less club scenes, I felt that because I think the first time I saw it, it was uh, those went on for quite a while, mm-hmm. and uh, I felt like the people in the club like you know just like get on with it you know like they have this nice show but everybody's just like you know show us some titties right yeah (laughs) i mean that that, that's the whole idea of um i think cosmo is kind of like an avatar for cassavetes where he's expected to deliver commercial product that's going to bring in you know the sales people want to see tits but you have this character and you also have uh mr sophistication who's trying to, you know, steal the show. He's trying to be the real star of that. Yeah, exactly. uh, trying to add some, you know, artistry to it and make it something that maybe it isn't or maybe is very difficult to communicate to the audience that's going to be in the club every single night, you know? So, I, I don't know. I think that aspect to it is interesting. Go ahead, Oz. I know you were going to say something. Yeah, I think um, I could relate this one, at least personally, to uh, Dick Tracy a little bit because it felt like, Every single one of the villains, if you want to call them that, was a different character. It was like a different bad character from like a noir. Yeah, and they were uh, all comic or like a they noir story. Disgusting faces. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that also kept me interested because they all look so different, and you didn't know when a new one was going to pop up. Every every time they that uh, um, the group showed up, I would notice a new one or, or a new person that I didn't notice before. Uh, so that whole. Uh, interaction between uh, Cosmo, who's still trying to play it cool and trying to pretend that, you know, this is nothing. He's just this successful uh, club owner, uh, even though he knows that, you know, that's not the case, uh, and just trying to play it off as as, as cool until, you know, truth uh, hits him in the face, uh, literally. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's it goes down from there. But, but that interaction between them two and that tension of, um, we don't even know who these gangsters are. We don't know what they're capable of. And then that double... What do you call it, a double switch or a double? What would you call that? You when, call it the old you know, switcheroo. That's what you call yeah, it. Yeah, when they they tell him just go kill this bookie, and then he finds out that he's like an actual what, like a boss, like the boss of the right? triad or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Might not even be Chinese. Uh, Mario, what do you think about Ben Gazar as a leading man? I loved it because uh, when you know when I first saw him in like Buffalo '66, I was like, oh, this guy is fucking just incredible and uh that was my introduction to him and i could uh you know i never got uh sick of watching him do his thing and just uh he just played it so well that like total scumbag bar owner and it's just like the uh perfect uh perfect job for a degenerate he's great i i really love ben gazar because he feels like you know, later in life, he'd probably get cast as like a, a special guest star and Everybody Loves Raymond or something. You wouldn't yeah. think anything of him. Uh, he does pop yeah. up in some weird movies in the late 90s and early aughts. I know he was in uh, Summer of Sam, that, that Spike Lee film. And yeah, Buffalo 66 is where he really, I think, shines probably last. Because after that, it's just like Law & Order guest star episodes where he's playing somebody who's either lawyer or a perp or, or something's going on with him. Uh, mm-hmm. And here he really has this movie to flesh out his acting abilities where he can just go from, you know, uh, volatile rage to just smirking and smiling and cool and calm and collected <laughs> like a crazy person. He's he's, yeah, he's, he's always got his girls. He could do no wrong with his girls yeah. on his side. But he has, he has like a weird vulnerability, too, that he, he seemed very much like a Danny DeVito character, you know, where where it's like. Its own physical limitations keep him from being that guy that he wants to be, but he's still trying and tries to convince himself by convincing everyone else, or at least trying to convince everyone else that he's that. 
but you know you're looking at him and you see that he's not and then there's that thing in his eye where you can tell that he's not confident on the bullshit that he's saying but uh he tries to play it off as that i don't know he, he was very uh, i found him to be very engaging as a as a leading man i guess uh mm, not yeah. wasn't really expecting that much just by by his look like i didn't know what to expect uh, i thought he might have just played it as you know goofy but at no point it felt goofy it it, if, it always felt like someone that um that didn't know what they were getting themselves into and then once they're in the hall it's like fuck like they don't know what to do so it's kind of like a caged animal but it's like a little ferret that can't hurt anyone i don't know uh i don't know if that made any sense but <laughs> that character like felt like very vulnerable and interesting to me and his performance had i guess everything to do with it yeah i like that you're never like oh this guy's gonna figure it out like i never yeah. had any faith in him you're just like oh Oh boy, this you know, is not going well. Something that uh, really struck out to me, especially on my most recent viewing of the the movie, is all the music that's in this film. I feel oh, like yeah. uh, this is a very accomplished soundtrack by uh, I believe the the musician's name is Bo Harwood, who doesn't really seem to have uh, too much in terms of film under his name, uh, aside from the Cassavetti movies, and I think he did a couple of films, maybe about ten fifteen years ago, that were. Uh, recognizable in title but uh, from the moment that the movie starts and you have uh, Cosmo like wandering around outside the club and seeing potential patrons drive by screaming out their car window you know it has a very distinct sound to it um, and I think it, it, it's a little more cleaned up and well put together in the re-edit of the film from 78 because a lot, I noticed that a lot of the sound is is very rough in the '76 version, which is not uncommon for Cassavetti's films, where you have maybe bad ADR or even repeating ADR. It was something in Husbands comes to mind where there's a Japanese girl on uh, on on vacation in England, and she's just screaming and shouting somewhere away from Peter Falk, and it's just uh, Japanese language repeating itself. The same take like three or four times on loop and he's expecting wow. you to notice um, <laughs> nothing as egregious as that in the 76 version but i noticed that those things were smoothened out with the 1978 one that was one of the things that caught my attention right from the beginning the music um again i i I guess I watched the trailer. I, this is one of the mo one of those movies that you mention every other podcast that we do. So I figured I'd watch it, but I wasn't expecting to be grabbed by that right from the beginning. Uh, so I, I agree. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what it is about that type of music or the type of music that they use that really got me engaged. But it's something that I noticed right away, and and it's continues throughout the whole movie, like the same type of. Uh, um, I don't, I don't, it's kind of a club music from that time, I guess, but I don't know. It works really well with, with how dirty and gritty everything looks. Uh, and, and you can tell that, uh, I mean, I'm not very aware of how the seventies were in, in the States or what, I don't even know where this is supposed to be. Uh, this in. is Los Angeles. Okay. Because everything looks shitty and like dirty and dirt and poor so i'm assuming that people were not doing great in the 70s and is portrayed perfectly in this uh and, and uh, it has that same kind of dirty feel that that um uh maniac had that you know we talked about before yeah. uh where you just don't don't know if you could recreate that now just because of how technology has changed so much yeah uh this might be the earliest example of like showing los angeles decayed I feel like up to this point, you would see Hollywood and films from like the 60s and whatnot, and it would be beautiful and glamorous. And I can't, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's an earlier uh, rendition of L.A. that m matches this movie. But to my knowledge, this feels like the first one where it shows you the underbelly, the grossness of it, uh, the seediness. So I, where did Chinatown take place? That was L.A. too, wasn't it? Oh, that yeah, might have been years so. before. Um, Mario, what is your what is your vibe on Cassavetes as a director in general? Are you, are you familiar with his other movies at all, or I've seen uh, Faces, Woman Under the Influence, and uh, fuck one more, and then this. So I've seen like four, and, and uh, I'm gonna keep like 
I want to watch like everything he's made. I, I've i seen, I would say, like a good three quarters of his movies. There's a couple of films that were done like direct to, not direct to, uh, they were like studio jobs that weren't uh-huh. passion projects. And he's kind of like the earliest filmmaker to pocket a lot of that studio money and then take it, buy his own equipment and make movies on his own accord. That's uh, pretty fucking cool. Yeah. So it, I, I think the first one might have been... Um, it faces is the one with the mixed race girl, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So that's, I think the first one he winds up doing. And then he goes on to do two studio projects that rubs him the wrong way. He decides not to continue on with that. And instead works as an actor where he does a film. Uh, he does Rosemary's baby. He also does a TV show where he's playing a private detective, Johnny staccato. He takes his money, buys his own equipment, starts making his own films. This comes at, the tail end of his career where after this he's going to do Gloria which is like another crime oriented film with Jenna Rollins and then uh, the final film even though it's not the final film is Love Streams which he winds up shooting with his wife and um, it's kind of like the swan song for his creative career even though he gets I can't find that movie anywhere Love Streams? Yeah I I have a pirated version on my computer so I don't. I can email it to you or something if you can't. That, if you can't find a pirate thing. That'd be awesome. Link. That'd save me. Uh, that'd save me some time. It's 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 kind of a, an odd surrealist film. Um, it's I it's it feels more accomplished and and professionally made in the same way that the re-edit of Killing of a Chinese Bookie does, and it's got uh, a lot of interesting moments and performances to it. Uh, he does one more film after that with Peter Falk, and the title of that escapes me at the moment but it was originally supposed to be directed by the guy who did the in-laws uh whereas peter falk big and, trouble yeah big trouble is the one and cassavetes hated that film so that was clearly like a a favor that he was just paying for his old buddy to do that as a you know as as a rebound director essentially yeah. so speaking I, of peter falk i uh, i just started columbo and oh, nice. <laughs> it is badass, dude. I thought it was just like a grandma show because it's what my grandma watches every day. And yeah. I was like, you know what? I'll check this out. And I was like, this guy is fucking amazing. Yeah, it's great. yeah, yeah. <laughs> every episode's like a little mini movie. It's great. I mean, Cassavetes, yeah, Cassavetes guest stars on uh, Columbo. He plays one of the uh, you know the baddies. Ben Gazar. I I have a Columbo poster over on my wall over there from like Poland from the 70s where they released uh, one of the episodes as a movie. I didn't even know. I wasn't familiar with Cassavetes or anything at the time. Turns out the episode was directed by Ben Gazzara. So, I, yeah, weird coincidence. Um, I got to watch that one. It's it's good. I mean, all the all the Columbo episodes to a point anyway are good. And then they kind of get silly. Then they kind of get murder, she wrote. Like what you were originally thinking Columbo is. That That is probably uh-huh. what it becomes in like the 90s. Do they? Yeah, because he looked young as shit in the beginning. Yeah. I was like, no way. Do they ever give him a sidekick or something like that to make it more family friendly? <laughs> it, he's, he, gets a, he gets a dog that pops up in a few uh-huh. episodes. Like the dog shows up in an episode from like 77 and then 98. I think that that's the only two appearances of this dog. <laughs> Not the same dog. No, clearly not the same dog. <laughs> yeah, Columbo's. Co- I mean that that was that's just a different time entirely. Where you could do one episode a month on television, and it'd be ninety minutes, and it'd be a little contained movie with Leslie Nielsen or whoever is the guest star that week. Mm-hmm. And it was almost always, you know, top notch. Yeah, that show that um, Jake used to on what was it tuesdays or wednesdays or whatever that's what we will watch just all time uh tv episodes that went on for way too long and like very interesting those shows are, are always interesting because they have very creative camera movements because of how clunky everything used to be so the equipment used to be huge so they would build these little sets for offices or whatever and everything would look very made up but they always got very creative with the way they would use their cameras and zooms and angles that it was always interesting to watch. Not so much maybe for the stories because they were kind of whatever, but just that very, um, I guess, primitive use of, of, of camera work and, and just very creative ways of uh, delivering the same type of, uh, of dramatic intent with the camera, but without having the, 
you know, the ease that we have now with, with the technology, too. Yeah, I think there's something much more charming about that, personally, where it feels like a soap opera, you know? Yeah. Where they have, like, one stage, and they're just trying to make the best of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the 1970s is pretty underrated as far as television goes. I was getting into, you know, when I because I've gone through, like, every episode of Columbo. The next thing that I got into was Kolchak the Night Stalker with, with that guy from uh, Christmas Story. The dad from Christmas Story. His, I, Dav, uh, Gavin uh, something. I don't know his last name. That's very good. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Those are like good little creepy, almost uh, Twilight zone episodes sometimes. But he plays like a noble reporter who is uh, investigating, you know, monsters and vampires and shit like that. That's pretty good. Isn't that what uh, David Duchovny was on Red Shoe Diaries without the aliens? Red Shoe Diaries? We <laughs> just read it. What are you talking about? <laughs> you would about? just read a letter. <laughs> Do you remember David Duchovny was the host of Red Shoe Diaries? I don't know what this show is. I've never heard of Red Shoe Diaries before. <laughs> never heard of Red Shoe Diaries. You're talking about Red uh -huh. Shoe Diaries? You're bringing up Stranger <laughs> by the Lake on the yeah. episode with Jerry? What's, what's wrong? What are you watching, yeah. Hans? Yeah, well, uh, back in the day before David Duchovny got uh, X-Files, I think, he was the host of this softcore pornography show on cinema where at the beginning of the show he would just receive a letter from someone and he would start reading the letter and then the person in the letter was the person that would fuck uh so the intro was always just him with like a cool car and like a pier or something just staring into the distance and then reading a letter and then people would start fake fucking him. sounds like californication yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Was before that <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm sure some of the ideas from that you know got on that show or something because it was always just like a a soft soft core porn uh plot but presented as you know this guy's just reading love letters that he he receives from from these very creative lovers yeah they they always try that where a show will strike out and then they'll just get the same star and they'll do a similar enough idea the second time and see if it works then like I know Cosby did that four or five times uh, before doing the Cosby show and then Cosby in the 90s. And then they're doing that with uh, like Kenan Thompson has a show coming out now where I feel like they tried to give him a show before, like after Kenan and Kel. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the same idea. I know they did that also with like John Mulaney. John Mulaney had a show with Martin oh, Short. Yeah. And it's just oh, like they, they'll recycle the same ideas over and over. Try a new person or try the same person and see what, what works, what sticks. Because they, they're just bankrupt. They're creatively bankrupt at this point. They have nothing yeah. else well, to work with. Keenan one is about his life, right? Yeah, with I mean, Don Johnson from Miami Vice as his dad or living <laughs> nanny or something. Like, what do, How does that make sense at all? How do these two people coalesce remotely? Like, What is the crossover? Are you expecting like old white people to tune into Keenan? Because Don Johnson is on there? Maybe. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think that's going to work. But that's completely it random. It is. It makes no sense. Um, anyway, Killing of a Chinese Bookie. What, what, what did you think about the flow of the narrative and the twist, Hans? Um, I, I wasn't expecting it, to be honest. Uh, the You know, when, when we find out that this Chinese man is actually not just a Bookie, um, I was not expecting that. I, 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 I was wondering what they were going to do with the story because there was still about an hour to go, I think, when that happens. Uh, but uh, I, I liked it. And again, uh, as, as, as long as this character just kept getting shot on and not resolving his issues, I was having a blast. So, But he kind of does, though. Like, Doesn't he kind of resolve his issues? I mean, he's got a bullet in him and he can't go to the hospital. Yeah. But... <laughs> Leading. But he he takes <laughs> out everyone trying to get him. I mean, maybe there's gonna be some Chinese people that, that try to kill him after. We don't know. But it seems like seems like he gets his way, kind of. I don't know. Mark, yeah. What, what did you think of the uh, the twist reveal in the uh, the eventual continuation of the narrative in the third act? I thought it was a super cool twist, and uh, I was just like, man, this guy is so caught up in his fucking shit and his little songs and his girls and like he i don't think like he really like going to a hospital like i don't think that that was he'd much rather just like have a glorious night where he's like the man than like go get patched up and have like a shitty night in the hospital i was like i, I think this guy's just gonna die right he just dies 
maybe i don't i mean yeah how uh how effective were the bullets in 1976 you know you could you could live with a yeah. bullet in you but well, um, he's he is bleeding a shitload right it's coming out of his jacket pocket but it, <laughs> it's not he, even he, out of well, his jacket. he got shot he got shot you're gonna bleed when you get shot but i mean he goes and does like three different things after he gets yeah, shot yeah. he goes and, yeah, and visits then... his girlfriend and her mom and then he gives like a good pep talk to the team and or oh yeah, the he? pep talk is amazing, and he's fucking wounded. Yeah, or is he dead? He's just died. He never killed oh, anyone. Oh yeah, it's the first reform thing right. where yeah, he's he's dreaming. <laughs> it's all it's all a death dream. He's gonna kiss the love of his life, and yeah, yes. Not even war movies have I heard such a heroic like go get him speech. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. he's a fucking dying club owner, you know. And what it, is it? What's, what's the thing he says? Like, be yourself, or like, you are enough, or shit. Like, I, like, I don't know. It was epic as fuck though, because I fucking wrote it down. I was like, holy shit, that's some heavy shit. Uh, I I love at the ending too. You know, Mister Sophistication finally has his moment, and then uh, just one of these whores runs up on the stage and spoils it for him. Just spoils the last <laughs> second of it. The uh, you know the landing, uh, and then you cut the credits. Really good font on this movie too, with the credits. I saw you were posting about uh, screen caps and whatnot from from the movie Hans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like the 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 look or the the fonts that they picked for it uh, because it, it makes it more makes it look more like a martial arts movie than it actually is. Like a Steven Seagal <laughs> film from the nineties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it looks like it looks like one of those you know Chinese martial art movies that that I think we've seen before in, in this show, but where you know the the aesthetics are very much from there and then you put them here and that's that and then just the chinese people that we saw is the only thing that's related to that at all uh but i really like the look of it and even the the cover of the or the poster that they use where it's just his red face being lit by a very strong red light uh it works really well and yeah i'm, I'm a big fan of, of what they chose to to use for for that type of thing She's not really something that, you know, really paid that much attention, usually. Yeah. If you take a look at the, the poster art for the 94 version, I'm pretty sure uh, somebody bought the rights to this movie and re-released it in theaters in the early 90s, trying to pass it off as, like, a brand new film. Uh, <laughs> this, I, I, I don't know how you do that, especially when Cassavetes has been dead for, like, five years or something at that yeah. point. Uh, and they just, like, bought, like, stock art of a man lying on the ground in a spotlight, like, shot, and it's terrible <laughs> it, look, yeah. it looks so uh video store e you know like you, mm -hmm. you see one of those but i mean there was no cutouts. there was no internet for you to know that right so of you course. would just buy it and then you get home and you're like oh fuck this movie's from 20 years an, ago an old man from the 70s with a receding hairline <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Com weird greasy come over right so uh <laughs> apparently this movie bombed in 76 and Ben Gazar hated this movie. The audience walked out and was warning the the people in line waiting for it not to watch the movie because they feel like they got tricked. They, feel, they felt like they got had. Um, and I think it was one. They wound up pulling it from theaters prematurely. And Cassavetes, I think, in order to get financing for what was going to be his next project, agreed to go back and edit the film. And they would re-release it in 1978, and that seems to be when it would take with audiences. And Ben Gazar wound up loving the film then. Uh, and it, it, that is kind of the reason why it has garnered somewhat of a reputation as like a good, not necessarily a cult film of the 70s, but uh, certainly an underrated or sometimes overlooked 1970s mm -hmm. crime feature. Yeah. It's in the big pile. Look at what movies came out of 76 and i mean i guess there there was some bangers there rocky cuckoo's nest network yeah that's a Marathon huge year Band. that's a massive year yeah. for for film in the 70s uh 77 is where it all changes then you get star wars and right then it becomes you know the the, the commercial model alters overnight yeah um what, what, yeah, it's crazy to think that this was even like, you know, if somebody made something like this now, it wouldn't. I I would not think that it had a chance to be in theaters. No, definitely not. No, this this is the type of movie nowadays that I think would be lucky 
if like Alamo Draft House or whatever would put it out for a weekend or did like a just week long screening before sending it direct to streaming or Blu ray. Yeah. The this movie like the idea of it was conjured up between uh both Cassavetes and Scorsese talking about exactly what winds up being the um the twist of the film where he winds up killing a mob boss instead of uh, a bookie like he's been told. I want to get back to some of the character actors in this movie, like mm. Timothy Carey. Another one is uh, what's his, Seymour Castle. Seymour Castle is fantastic in this movie. Dude, uh, that guy's amazing. Is that the guy with the mustache? Yes. He's got a yes. big, big orange mustache Mort, and everything. I think his name is? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with his character name. He's great in this movie as well. Um, it really... I feel, I feel like he casts the perfect people to just give you like a sense of dread that at any moment something terrible is going to happen to Cosmo whenever he's with them in their presence. And that mm. that's conveyed, I think, at the fullest when he's in the car with them. And they're basically saying, you don't have to do this, but you, you should do this. But you don't have yeah. to. It's like they're going to you. You're dead if you don't do this. That was a scary. That was a scary part. Well, that's one of the things that the things that the director did really well in that scene was portraying how everyone was just out to get him because every every time we see one of the one of the gangsters they're looking straight into the camera and we see the back of his head at every time so the, there's that uh, it, it's it's on purpose that we feel that tension of him and like just not knowing like what they're going to do to him next and I I, I think because we've been exposed to so many gangster movies, us uh, seeing them with like 2021 20, eyes, uh, we expect something bad to happen just because, you know, that's what happens in those types of movies. Uh, but it, 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 it's, it's shown very clearly by just the, the camera movements that Cassavetes decides to use whenever those scenes happen because everything is framed in a way that the villain is the main uh, focus, even if uh, the Cosmo character is speaking, uh, we're still focusing on the reaction that he's getting instead of getting him, uh, which just raises the tension between you know what are they going to do to him or or what what this thing is that they're telling him is one thing, but it might be something else. Like there's that uncertainty that helps yeah. that scene in particular a, a lot. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's like the not badass side of this world, you know. It's like the the bummer part of it the whole time, and that's what's uh, that was so refreshing to me that it was like so. Not, I don't want to say not badass because I think it's a badass movie, <laughs> but like it just shows how like you know in reality that can be a very not badass lifestyle and it could suck super bad. No, yeah, I I, com- I completely agree with you. I I think they nail nail uh, the realism of what that is like. And what living in L.A. during that time, existing in that scene and having those uh, terrible habits, terrible financial compulsions uh, will do to a person. Yeah. But also, I, I think I think that he, he does a really good job at keeping it small, too, because, you know, if you have gangsters, you might have the, the idea of making it bigger than it is just because of how big you can make it. But with this, it always feels like the gangsters that are threatening him but you don't really know if they're that scary or not, you know, that you, you don't know what they're capable of because you never see them do anything really uh, until, you know, they punch him there kind of. Uh, so it, it, it's a thing of uh, we, we have gangsters that are going after our main character, but we don't know if they're really, really bad or if just, or just slightly badder than him. You right. Know? I, so, you do get the impression at some points that maybe they're not as high level as yeah. the implication that's being made. Right. Yeah. Um, and this Timothy Carey character, do you know his name off the top of your head, Hans, who he plays in this movie? No, but I can find it. Flo. Flo? Yeah. I'm not calling him Flo. I'm going to call him Timothy Carey. That's All terrible. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I'm fairly certain he's a, you know, I didn't get this on the first go around. Maybe the information didn't absorb into my head. Uh, he's also indebted to these guys and he's going to be in charge of killing Cosmo, right? Cause he's, when we open to the gambling sequence, which is apparently just at like somebody's mom's house, this high stakes yeah. poker game <laughs> where people are gambling for $30,000 or in, and onward. Um, he's in the waiting room as well, talking about, 
nothing's oh, beyond yes, hope sure. and whatnot. That's the first introduction of that character. And then later on, he's informed that the bookie has been killed and that he's going to have to take care of Cosmo, which he doesn't do. And he winds up right. being the only one of the gangsters to get out of it alive because Cosmo sets the trap in the parking lot. Um, He's also like the drunkest guy in the movie, it seemed, right? (laughs) (laughs) Like, he was like, uh, you could see that he was kind of a fuck-up, too. Yeah. But at that moment, he wasn't the main Mm fuck-up. No, it just might have been the actor. He seems very unhealthy in, like, every shot. I mean, (laughs) if you watch him, I don't know if Minnie Moskowitz was before this. I think it was. Uh, There's a scene of him at a diner, and he's just making conversation with Seymour Castle, and he looks like he's sweating, he's bloated. He looks better in this movie, so maybe he cleaned things up in, in the gap between then. Yeah. But he always looks, like, very rough. Like, he was just, like, hard drinking or, or doing something bad uh, yeah. right before shooting. Um, but he's, he is such a great actor. He's full of uh, personality. He's one of, like, the first few guys to get work in Hollywood and usher in a naturalistic form of acting. Marlon Brando gets a lot of the credit for that, but if you take a look at his earliest works, like The Killing, he's doing that before many people are. Where he's, he's you know, he sticks out from each one of those movies that he appears in. And he's got a weird directing credit in the 1960s that he financed himself and did, and it's called The World's Greatest Sinner. Are you guys familiar with that at all? No. It's a it's a strange little film. It's weird. He plays the devil in it, and he also plays like a dude who's selling religion. I don't know. He's a very bizarre guy. Uh, there's stories that Crispin Glover has told about him, because I guess Crispin Glover was a fan and met him before he passed away in 1994, where he invited him over, and they were talking for four hours strictly about flatulence. He was very obsessed with farts. He would talk about farts at length, but like in a very serious way, not like a joke. What the fuck? Yeah, just a, just, <laughs> just a weird guy. Um, God. Yeah. Also, I think he was on Columbo one time, so there's there's that as well. He's one of my favorite actors, Timothy Carey. Very. I'll look out for him as I go through the series. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the budget in this? Do you know if it was close to nothing? I, it, I my guess is probably like a million dollars. Because I think that that's uh, I don't know the the fact that he kept it so small uh, made it so much better. And I, I wonder if but because again I'm not not very familiar with Casavetti's work. I think this is, might be his first. Oh no, I saw I saw um, Husbands, uh, but it it feels like his movies are just like small. Like he doesn't try to go big, right? He doesn't try to go for the glossy for the you know beautiful for the the shiny uh both of those movies feel very small very greedy and 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 low budget uh so i'm wondering if that has something to do with the fact that he kept the the villain of this movie uh so small or so non-threatening i guess until you know you get to the chinese um and and uh i wonder if maybe another director with higher expectations would try to make it bigger since you know you, you are getting kind of a well, gang thing it's funny you say that yeah. they were going to do a remake of this movie in the 90s that nick cassavetti's his son was the director of john q in the notebook very different path of uh movies but yeah. he's, a, he's actually he's a he's a fairly solid director he's just a very like for hire director you know um they wrote a script to do a remake of this in the 90s and who was going to direct it brett ratner was going to direct it so that could have actually Eesh. happened, where we see the the rush hour version of this. The what did what, what did Brett Ratner do? <laughs> Bad Boys, Bad Boys Two, one of those movies. Oh God, I can oh, totally please. see like a rush hour version of this. Now that you say that, like somebody uh, just really. What year did you say in the nineties? Ninety five, ninety six. Yeah. God, who knows what that would have been like? I mean, Jackie Chan would have been the Chinese bookie. Chris Tucker could have, could have been Cosmo. I don't know. Well, Brett and Ratner in 95 was doing the Angelo music videos. Uh, so maybe it was a little, it might've been 97 or so. It was, it was, it was when Brett Ratner finally came up as like a prominent director. Yeah. Rush hour. Yeah. So yeah. Rush maybe, hour. All right. Maybe, maybe more been, open shirts. Yeah. It would have been like more. the players club with ice cube, you know? Yeah. But some uh, abs, a lot more abs. It could have been good. It could have been great. Right. Hans. No. No, no. Was uh, no, I, was Casavetti's a uh, 
Sorry. Do, do you know if Cassavetes oh. was like a boozer? Because I feel like he. Oh yeah. He he <laughs> nails he nails alcohol in movie in his films like no other. Yeah. Like where it's like alcohol is being used as a tool like in reality sometimes you know like even when he pours that shot into the girl's mouth after she uh you know <laughs> catches him trying out a girl and he's like oh here you know here baby is just pouring it in her mouth and she's like a baby not taking her food and i was just like oh my god like a guy that's been out all night like just got some breakfast and now he's gonna get a see a you know get a naked waitress in front of him that is like would his that's like uh, his behavior would be like that. Yeah. It killed and he him. Would use, it uses alcohol. Uh, oh, really? Yes. He died in early death uh, because God. of, uh, what is it? Uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Yeah. He died at 59. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's such a decision maker. It was like nice to see the impact of alcohol, like on, you know, scenes and like uh, just development in the story. Like it's, uh, he, he does it really well. Yeah, Cassavetes there... was a, a massive alcoholic. He, that, he, was, um, he was supposed to die. Like his doctor said, yeah, you got six months, dude, in like 1981. And it freaked him out so much that he wrote like an autobiography uh, within that time. He was expecting to die, but he didn't die until 1989. So he was able to do uh, Love Streams and he was able to do Big Trouble within that time. But if you see any, if you see him in any movies in the '80s, he looks extremely rough. He looks like not how a fifty-year-old should should probably look. Needless to say, yeah. Uh, well, what do you say, Hans? But he, but he does get that drunk behavior really well, which is really difficult to see. Yes, you know where where it's not just drunk on film that you're used to seeing on film, but in this one, you've seen people like this. If you've been drunk at two in the morning somewhere, you know that yeah. that way of acting that it's not just typical drunk but it's like oh yeah well of course yeah you know this dude guy like would movies do movies show people drink like a bottle of vodka and then they're just like you know yeah fucking like nothing happened and they're just <laughs> yeah. like yeah uh you know they're supposed to be so drunk and it's like do people just not is it's just hard to act drunk i guess or like is that director is not like thinking about how much this would actually influence a character it's uh, it's nerds writing the scripts, you know. They just sit at home all day with their, glass, their pen and pad. They're not doing any. Yeah. They're not living. They've life. never drank a bottle of vodka. They don't know what happens. Exactly. <laughs> they have no life. They know more about what like, pissing the bed after drinking than the behavior because they just pass out. Yeah, Ben Gazar makes a pee pee and then <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he cries. Uh, let, let me ask you something about Buffalo 66. Did you get the impression that Vincent Gallo was inspired by Cassavetes? Because he says, oh, no, I don't, I don't like Cassavetes at all. I, his films, I find them overrated. But then you watch yeah. Buffalo 66 after checking these out. And even yeah. like the Brown Bunny. And it feels like... That's extremely hard to believe. Come on. But... <laughs> yeah, you cast Ben Gazzara. And, he's, and it's like traditional 70s Ben Gazzara being yeah. himself, being his dirty old man self. Uh, and not like then 90s ben gazar which is like a slicker yeah. guy and I, I think some people just don't want to like uh be that open with sharing their influences and yeah. uh they'll just take it to the grave and he's just one of those guys i think and uh but yeah i definitely like because like when i saw buffalo 66 for the first time i was like oh my god this is like nothing i've ever seen before this is like a new thing to me and then you know, seeing something like Chinese Bookie, I'm like, oh, oh, I could, <laughs> I could see yeah. where this came from, yeah. and uh, yeah, I don't know. He, I, I totally has, think that he probably loves this movie. Has he ever said that he likes anyone? Yeah, he's got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he likes uh, Pasolini. Ha! <laughs> okay, great. That, that's about it. Uh, he likes Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom. Br there you go, Tom Candace Owens. He's got a big thing. Uh, Candace Owens, I hear. His I views. love his football. I love his football posts. I love all his posts. He's, he's, he's wild. It, but they all get taken down within five hours. Either the yeah. tags get get flagged or he gets reported. So you really got to be there to see it. Makes yeah, we got to screenshot him and just save him forever. Enjoy How old is he now? He's, Are we uh, about to lose him? Are we about to lose Vince Gallo because he's old? I think he's Cassavetti's age at his time of death. I think he's 59. 
So uh, hopefully he hopefully looks he like a healthy me. guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when <laughs> I've ever seen him look healthy ever? <laughs> yeah, he's uh like he's skinny, right? He's got that going for him. Yeah, I think he's uh he's a very clean eater. I don't think he does anything as far as substance. He loves to go. call people fat. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's refreshing. Man, he is like the only good thing on social media right now. And it's only a matter of time before he gets clipped, I think. But oh yeah, for for now, we're just gonna savor it. I think this is all warming up uh, for him to release some of those movies he's got hanging out in the vault. I think Ooh, that's that would be great. Is gonna culminate too. Otherwise, I mean, if he was just gonna keep it to himself, what's the point of going back to Instagram? Especially now that Trump is kicked off there. He only follows one account. Is Trump? Trump's been <laughs> banned. So what? What is he doing now? You know, gotta put those movies out. Um, Man, I hope so. That'd be cool. That would be. I, w- I would be thrilled. We definitely need it now more than ever. I mean, twenty twenty one is actually not off to a terrible start as far as far as movies go. I, I've watched maybe about five or six movies that have been released so far this year, and um, there's a good little like small New York movie about uh, a cam girl and a creepy guy who's kind of like obsessed with her, but it's more of a comedy. And they got some safety brother leftovers. They have Julia Fox and Buddy Duress in it. It's called Private Chat. It just came out, I think, on Tuesday. And that, was, that surprised me because a lot of those movies wind up pretentious. You know, yeah. It's a lot of rich kids who have the right equipment and have the, the money to get names involved. And then they'll just yeah. make a painfully boring film. There's so many movies that like out. that. Private Chat I thought was pretty good. Have you watched I, any good uh, movies? I, I went in the theater like two days ago. You have theaters that are open up there? Yeah, they don't give a fuck. I went in. What'd you see? Uh, on Valentine's Day, I saw Judas and the Black Messiah. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was heavy. Yeah? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know how those uh, events ended in real life, so uh, I'm not a historian. And uh, I was shocked. I was shocked, dude. It, it, it left me feeling uh, very, very unsettled. I was, uh, I was thinking about watching it because I have HBO Max and, uh, you know, it's available through there. But uh, I don't know. I, I, t- I take a look at like Lakeith Stanfield in a beret and I'm just like, this dude's cosplaying. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. for whatever reason, like, modern costume design doesn't feel as legitimate to me. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's the actors looking. Like... Oh, dude, there's an opening scene where he's dressed like straight up Dick Tracy. And that's his like <laughs> undercover. That's his like undercover uh, costume when he's pretending to be a uh, an undercover FBI. And uh, yeah, it looks like he looks like straight out of the mask. But uh <laughs> I had a fun time. I think I could have seen anything, though. Just being in the theater, like, it was, it felt fucking amazing. Yeah. The last time I went, I had to go to New Jersey, which is a good, like, hour and a half trip for me. And uh, I went to go see Akira, because they were doing a re-release of that in the AMC theaters, because the uh-huh. the 4K Blu-ray. And that was fantastic. That was the only time I got to the movie theater last year. And then, uh, Hans, you probably have, like, one corner theater where they play like Three Stooges shorts and like the little children <laughs> go and watch them for a quarter. We got watch. all cartoons, the whole Fritz Lang cartoons. Yeah. Wait, Fritz Lang didn't do cartoons. Fritz Lang, what? Walter, Walter Lang. <laughs> you mean Fritz the Cat? <laughs> no, 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 no. Fritz Lang. That, Fritz he was Lang, a director. the eye patch German director who got, yes. who left Nazi Germany. Yeah, to make uh, those war movies over here. Um, yeah, they're open here. Everything is open. I don't know what happened here. I think, well, we're such a tiny country that depend on tourism so much that you can't close that. And they did that the entirety of last year. And people, you know, we don't we don't even get, well, you guys don't get it either, but we don't get government help, right? But only the very, very... I don't get government help either, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you, you guys should, but we are such a tiny country. I want country a link card, man. I want a link card fucking bad. Because groceries are not fun. Yeah. The, th- the thing here is that because of that, now even our borders are open, so you can't come in and go to the beaches or whatever. We have a, a, a curfew of 10 p.m. So you can do whatever you want up until 10 p.m. And then at 10 p.m. you do have to go. But everything is open. So even movie theaters, you, you go to a supermarket and people don't even social distance anymore. Uh, an old lady got mad at me because I asked her to step back a couple of steps and she like gave me shit. And I was just like, I, you guys forgot already that this was supposed to be a big deal. And now like 
You just wear a mask and that's it. At the least here. In, in uh, yeah. Here in New York, at the Port Authority, where you have like Walgreens and you have Rite Aid, you know, you'll get the little stickers on the floor that say stay six feet apart, but the stores are all like very small and the yeah. stickers are maybe like two and a half feet apart from one another. So it's, 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 a, who gives a shit? Just don't, I mean, don't cough in somebody's face. You'll be fine. Um, at the same time, like, I don't want to go to the theater here because like you said, <laughs> it's not three stooges, but it's like whatever mainstream huge movie it is or whatever new bullshit horror movie with, with no plot and jump scares comes out. That's what they show here. Uh, so I, I need to find like an alternative theater or something that shows like independent movies or anything like that, because otherwise I'm, I'm stuck an alternative watching theater. You know, so you Vin watch, Diesel. Like, Warhol shorts in your private time. You want to go to an art gallery and watch movies. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I wonder how the uh, numbers are going to do. Cause like, I just really wanted to go to a fucking theater, but like I could have just pulled it up on HBO max and watched it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it doesn't. A lot of people would think that that makes zero sense to go out and see that if it's available at your house. No, I, I think the context of what you watch matters almost as much as what you're watching. Uh, it can definitely affect the the experience, which is kind of like a you know people were looked at as snobs before for saying that like oh no it's just not the same if you're watching it in a theater. But I think this past year has definitely proven that. I think yeah. a, a yeah. lot of the shitty movies from two thousand uh, twenty twenty could have been elevated maybe in people's opinions if it was had been screened on, on a theater screen. But uh, when you do everything direct to streaming, there's no fanfare around the movie. There's nothing to get excited about. And this right. is a, what, what is Martin Scorsese is getting yelled at about this today because he decided to open his mouth again and all the <laughs> Marvel Disney freaks are, are spazzing uh. about it. Uh, he said, oh, when you label films content and you just usher them out to a streaming platform, then there's nothing spectacular about that. They're easily forgotten. They're conveyor belt products, essentially. Just <laughs> So uh, I completely agree with that. I think that's definitely yeah. the case. And um, it's part of the reason why we don't have a lot of interest, I think, around what's well, being released. That's why movies that come out on streaming sites are not going to be remembered five years. They're not. Think of a movie that came out exclusively on stream five years ago that is still relevant now that you can say hey this one you know what it's beast of no nation that's it maybe maybe like, nothing else everything else looks the same everything else has like the same tone the same pretty people in it the same there's nothing interesting about them so it's just well like he's saying just convey just content you know it's like having like following a youtube channel you just you get content every day. It's probably bullshit, but you know what? It's new, so I'll just watch the new thing. Uh, but nothing is really memorable. There's nothing that really sticks with you or that you can say, you know, let me recommend this to my friends that really like this type of movie because everything just feels average. Like nothing is higher than a five, maybe. You know? I, I, I think uh, that I don't. I haven't looked at the Apple streaming platform at all. Mario, do you have Apple streaming? No, I do no. not. I'm a HBO Max, uh, devout HBO Max follower. Yeah, HBO Max has been terrific because you have at least like Turner Classic movies and all that. I was watching Gone with the Wind last night. I was expecting an intermission where I could pause, yeah. uh, and they removed that. So I just wound up finishing the movie after three hours and 40 minutes. Yeah. Jesus. Um, Jesus. It's, it's good. Hey, it's good. It's good. But that's a, that's a, that's a full night. That's a night gone. I would only do that for Justice League. I'm getting ready. Hell yeah. <laughs> Justice League. See, Hans, look, you're going to be looking so dumb in a couple of, what, one I month am, when everybody I'm, sees this and everybody's like, that that saves cinema. I hope everybody's so. Everybody's sucking I, off Snyder. He's bad, I, baby. I, <laughs> oh, can you imagine how much more, like, he already has an army of... Mentally not there. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, you got goons. You how got dare goons you? that'll kill yeah. for him. Yeah, he does, yeah. And I mean, fine, perfect. I, that's the thing. Like, I don't want to hate it, but nothing that I've seen makes Are me. Are you excited. sure about that? So the last one, yeah, dude. I, I'm a fucking dork that had no friends growing up and loves superheroes. You think I don't want to see that on screen and make it cool? But that's the thing. I it's not. And the the ones that he released, I haven't liked. So it's like uh, I'm not even. You know, I don't what, expect. But what did you dislike? What What was it you dislike? You dislike Batman versus Superman. 
That one's fine. That, that, one's, well, that one's fine. fine. It doesn't bother me that much. Uh, so what do you got a the problem Superman with? Was, the Superman one, I thought it was painfully boring. That's uh, Man of Steel. That's, I thought that one was just... That's crazy. And, and it could be that I just don't care about that I'll character at all. I'll probably never watch Aquaman. That's, that's, it's safe I, to I've say never I'll seen... never watch Aquaman. No, never Aquaman. seen a Flash movie, I probably won't see it. Aquaman I don't know. was so terrible. I have, because I, I did like, a, you know, uh, I was buying a whole bunch of 4K Blu-rays during Black Friday. I got Aquaman, and uh -huh. it took me a year to watch it. I, I feel like I wasted my six dollars buying that. That was that was atrocious. It was like the worst kind of bad '90s action film. Um, but you hold on, you didn't give a title that you don't like for Zack Snyder besides Man of Steel, which you just said was boring. Which I don't is... like Sucker Punch. I don't like uh, what else has he done? Uh, uh, Dawn well, of the Dead is fine. Dawn of the Dead, Watchmen, Three Hundred. Watchmen, I don't care for really. That's crazy. Uh, too. I like Three Hundred. But yeah, Watchmen, it, it's, uh, I just don't think that you can do that story well and make it, in, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't really know what, what problem I have with Watchmen. I haven't seen it in a while, but I just remember being very underwhelmed by it. Uh, it was, I thought it was like pretty with, well done, like, like, a, like in a Sin City sense or something where you're like, all right, you're really going to try to put this comic book into a movie like, and be faithful and not piss anybody off who likes the books and... Like, I think that that it, it, you know, hits all the, uh, you know, checks all the boxes there. Like, yeah, I, I would say that like 2005 to 2009 was an exciting time for comic book movies because before it went like they overindulged and decided to put out like four comic book films a year and just make this like the new de facto release for cinema. Um, where in the 90s, you know, comic books weren't cool at all, but they were kind of like dipping their toe into the water as far as like adaptations went with like big budgets, not the 1970s bad yeah. TV Captain America or the Japanese Spider-Man, you know. And, uh, you know, you would get Batman movies. You would get maybe a failed Superman film or uh, some of these Fantastic third rate. Four. Well, yeah, Fantastic <laughs> Four never got released. But was then, V for Vendetta around the time? Yes, V for Vendetta was 2007. So Early 2005, years. Batman Begins happens. That's a tremendous hit. Warner Brothers has a whole bunch of uh, money because of eventually Dark Knight, where they can just right. green light all sorts of properties. And you get like a, a good string of adaptations of uh, graphic novels. Ooh, times were good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Times. <laughs> you got Sin City, oh, V for Vendetta, was, Watchmen wait, 300, that, that all in the before, same couple of years. That was before Marvel, right? Or was like yeah. Iron Man 1 out? No, no, no. That was 2008. Because, because I remember that at that time, there was that fear of, well, now is everyone's just going to try to do Nolan, right? Like, that was a thing that, at least I was afraid of them trying to do someone goofy like Aquaman serious and look at what they did. But, uh, but that was the fear. And then Marvel came in and just, like, kind of got rid of that. And now it's not greedy and dark anymore. And it's just about, like, the Hulk farting. When he's angry, you know, or, or, or something of that completely out of place. Uh, well, they've done most of the, like, good taste comics, like, in that, like, that time period. You're talking about, like, what, you know, comic book fans, like, put on a pedestal, like, as the best of the best. And uh, mm -hmm. that stuff's, like, not really the same as whatever, you know captain america was ever doing secret or, wars yeah well we're gonna you know like 19, shit like that yeah 1980s bad comic book run and then adapt it to an already like again creatively dead <laughs> series of films that but was, then i like those like early x-men movies like x-men one x-men two oh, yeah, i enjoy yeah, yeah, those yeah and essentially before marvel studios became marvel studios right a lot of that was good like the sam raimi spider-man movies were were great uh, the early yeah. X-Men films were good. As soon as they decided we have to make sure all of these are linked together, then that became that became a problem. Yeah. Um, Dude, nothing's been better than Spider-Man, than Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Nothing. Like, wipe your ass with every Avengers movie. Fucking, <laughs> yeah. Nothing comes close to that. Like, just being a good movie, nothing even fucking touches that for me. Like, it, like as far as Marvel shit goes. I agree. I completely agree. They're trying to rope that into the current MCU, and Tobey Maguire's the only holdout for that. He wants much more money than what they're offering. They're like, all right, we got Alfred Good. Molina. 
We've got Willem <laughs> Dafoe, who apparently will do anything now for money. Very <laughs> unfortunate. Um, and Andrew Garfield and somebody else from the Amazing Spider-Man ones. But Tobey Maguire, I guess, is is putting up a little bit of a fight with them. He's he's gonna show up like Tobey Maguire and Brothers. I just saw that movie. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that, that was fucking hilarious. Like, when he was just so ghostly white, and dude, like, <laughs> I just thought it was a comedy, dude. I could not stop fucking laughing. He, oh, he's placed arranged this? in that. Brothers is when he's like a POW, they assume him dead, and then Jake Gyllenhaal pulls a Hunter Biden and decides he's going to mac on his dead brother's girl and uh, oh. gets together with her. And then, oh, he just shows back up one day. Actually, no, he ain't dead at all. Actually, he's going to be head of the family again. And Jake Gyllenhaal, you're going to have to go sit on the swings by yourself and cry. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just super weird. And I don't know. I guess I should. it really wasn't that funny, but I could not stop fucking laughing every time they cut to Tobey Maguire, malnourished and freshly tortured. <laughs> yeah. <by terrorists. laughs> and he's just so sad and pissed off. Well, they try to make him... I just search it up and just by his look they try to make him look badass right they try to make him look like this bad you know threatening guy because there's a couple of uh screen shots here of him just screaming angrily so i'm assuming that he's supposed to be threatening right in this mm -hmm. movie but it's toby Maguire, so it's the same thing as what they're doing with tom holden where they have him as like uh oh, cherry. What is this movie? that that's the bank robber movie cherry well, that, and then there's also doing the uh, this video game movie. Uncharted. What's it called? Uh, yeah, with him as like this action star, action hero. It's like that's that's a boy. That's still a. I don't that's, care. He's that's thirty. Well, yeah, yeah. I boy. saw like a yeah. uh, magazine fucking just like thing on Instagram that was like, uh, it was like Tom Holland dressed dark, like Tom <laughs> Holland lets us in on his bad side. And I'm yeah, just like, like this fucking stuff. 17 year old kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Has no bad side. He never did anything bad yet. It's like those high beast moms that dress their little kids with like adult clothing and post them on Instagram. And mm -hmm. he's just like a little boy with Jordans. That's what he feels like when they try to pass him off as like an adult action star. So, he's I mean, boy, this, is, this is kind of what I was getting at with the whole Judas and the Black Messiah thing. I don't know if it's that the costume design is bad on modern movies where it looks just like they went and got a bunch of outfits from Party City or if mm -hmm. it's that everybody looks younger now. Right, Ben Gazzara in Killing of a Chinese Bookie is what, like thirty six, and yeah. uh, no, I, I think he's actually close to right. <laughs> what? <No. laughs> uh, Hans is thirty six, right? Thirty five. I'll be thirty five on oh, Friday. I'm I... sorry, I'm not trying to pad your, yeah, your age here. That's right. Uh, no, but like uh, Ben Gazzara is only like in his forties in this movie. You take a look at a forty year old today, not even close to the same. Nobody's aging. That I mean, even with like cosmetic surgery and you know wealth aside. People look younger now at 30 and 35 than they did back in 1970, 1980 when they were doing these these types of movies. So you have, uh, what's his name? Keith, like Keith Stanfield, and then I forget the actor from Black Mirror and Get Out uh, that's also in that yeah. movie, Judas and the Black Messiah. These guys are 30 Ulubu. years old, but they look like 24, Ulubu. 25. Who? What, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah. You're saying Woo Woo Woo. His, his name. Hold on, yeah. I'll get it right. The guy's name. <laughs> Kaluuya. Daniel Kaluuya. Okay, yes. That was close. That was close. Not racist at all, just close. Um, yeah, that movie almost it, did the thing that um, Spike Lee did at the end of Black Landsman with, like, the CNN shit. Oh. Which, oh, uh, no. which it, it almost did that, but... I think it, it, it didn't go all the way at the end with that, but I really didn't like that at the end of uh, Black Klansman. That really, like, uh, I don't know, just threw me off. Like, what's the point of even making this movie, dude? If you're just going to fucking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're gonna tell us what's on yeah, the news right. at the end. Yeah. It felt like, like defeating the whole fucking purpose, man. He, I feel like he finished the movie, and like a week before it was set to come out, he just like turned on the news and got really pissed off about something, and then threw that in at yeah. the very end, just <laughs> patched that in on Final Cut Pro. Yeah. It, it, it really uh, sucked the wind out of the movie a little bit. Um, well, that, that's what Five Bloods feels like, too. Whenever they show modern-day activists, that shit feels like he's completely put on at the end, just try to fit it in with this war story about this bunch of friends that has nothing to do with whatever's happening in the modern day. But because of Donald Trump, he felt like he had to put this 
news footage and make it about Black Lives Mattering or, or whatever the fuck message he Which, was trying to convey. Now, that. mind you, if, if Trump doesn't run in 2024, if he just disappears, right? Now, all of this has already aged poorly and it's going to look very yeah. uh, overreactive now to a one-term president. But like five, 10 years from now, what is the story going to be? You know, how do you how do you have all these films exist and be <laughs> able to be rewatched? If, like, imagine if we were just watching films like today. What if just in the middle of Killing of a Chinese Bookie, there was just like a, a random like tangent against Jimmy Carter? And how, how much would that really vibe with, you know, the, the history of this country and like nowadays? Like it seems I don't know. People people are I mean, we're not breaking new ground by saying, oh, people getting mad about politics is annoying. But. You know, but it, what sticks too? because um, it's not that we're going to remember everything that they're saying about Donald Trump today in 10, five years. We're going to remember the two couple of things that everyone remembers. So uh, even if, let's say, Jimmy Carter did a lot of atrocities or whatever, <laughs> uh, we're not going to we're not going to remember that 40 years from now or 20 years from now, whenever that that movie is seen again. So everything that they say that's directed to him is going to feel out of context or like weird. Because just like they're doing with George Bush now, where nobody remembers what he actually did, and now he's like, oh, he's, he's nice now. Uh, I'm he sure that's going to happen with Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's exactly. a great painter. He's an adorable I'm, old man. I'm yeah. sure that's going to happen with Trump because that always happens with politicians. So then what's it going to be? Oh, Spike Lee was freaking out about this orange guy that I guess, what did he do? He's an Ellen now in 2040. I don't know. You know, whatever the Ellen of the time is. I don't know. But yeah. you know what I mean? Like it's it's just completely unnecessary. And yeah, it feels like let's 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 drive it through this message that wasn't there to begin with, just because of you know what yeah. we're they thinking. they showed a little bit of uh like you know old news footage from like the real guy in uh Black Messiah, but it was it didn't like go over it wasn't like it didn't feel like overkill. And uh oh man, the end of that movie is uh anticlimactic to say the least. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I felt uh, I felt something walking out of that theater. I felt do uncomfortable. You feel, how I felt. Do, you, <laughs> do you feel compelled to go on Twitter and make a video about how sorry you are? No, or... but but damn, <laughs> I was like, man, I felt fucking super weird. But uh, I'd say it was a good movie. I had a good time. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'd recommend it. I'll check it out on one of the HBO Max or something one day. Yeah, I I guess I'll uh, I'll probably get around to checking it out at some point. It expires. I kind of like that it does expire after a while. Like they took uh, yeah. Woman eighty four down. I watched. Oh, the, finally. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, finally. Uh, I watched the Little Things with uh, the Denzel Washington and oh. Jared Leto. And oh, so did I. What did you think of that movie? I uh, I actually was not like annoyed by Jared Leto in that movie. Yeah, I, I I wasn't annoyed by him, but I'm just like, is your is your personality just Jim Carrey now? Are you just Jim Carrey in every movie? Because that was what he was like, kind of acting as in Suicide Squad. His Joker yeah. was just Jim Carrey, and he's got that vibe of old Jim Carrey in this one too. Are you are you ready for his uh, fucking long haired leather face outfit looking oh. ass in uh, his little Justice League clip? Oh yeah. Uh. He's the first two-time theatrical Joker. I, I mean, Hans, how do you feel about that? What an honor. Yeah, great. <laughs> the best one. The best. The best one of them all. I'm glad he's back and made him look like a Hot Topic shopper from 2008. Listen, I'll, I I'll, wonder I'll, if they I, took any tattoos away. I'll tell you what. I'm, uh, I, I was obviously not a fan of the Joker in Suicide Squad, but I'm kind of glad that he does have an opportunity to try to do something different. So if he blows it this time, then... There's no excuse. Like you can blame it on David <laughs> Ayer to some extent for using bad takes or whatever. Maybe it doesn't matter. You got two attempts now to play Joker in two very different ways. It seems like if if this sucks, he should probably be blacklisted from Warner Brothers. That's my thinking. Well, he's gonna show up in a dream, right? That's what they're setting up on the trailer. That he kind of like pops up in one of Batman's dreams or whatever. No, no, right? no, 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 no. So here's the thing. And just he have like an actual. He has like an actual. Role what, with multiple scenes, or we get, we get a glimpse of that in Batman vs Superman, where he's in the desert and everything, and there's a sabotage. I'm fairly certain Justice League, you're going to see that fulfilled all the way through, and then Flash is going to go and back in time, and it's going to be fixed or whatever. 
That's nah. how it's probably going to end. I think. I think. Uh, you know, if Zack Snyder's not contracted for any more movies at Warner Brothers or DC, so I'm I'm pretty sure it's going to be. I don't know. It might have a very big ending. Might have some people die, and stay dead. I can't imagine what it's like to have that like fire under your ass like people are just waiting for you to fuck this up again and like <laughs> and Joaquin's just chilling there eating a veggie burger like chill as fuck like yeah like he doesn't yeah. have to worry about shit everybody else is like Leto you motherfucker you better not <laughs> who has more pressure Leto or Zack Snyder oh Zack Snyder oh Zack <laughs> Snyder probably because it's been years because, of, I think... of hype for this Snyder cut I just think Leto, no one's expecting anything from his Joker just because of what we got already. So whatever he does, as long as it's better than the last one, is going to be I, great. I guess just bitch about everything on the internet because it just gives, just change just happens like that. And you get yeah. new cuts of you, yeah. some movie that you thought you were going to like a lot and then you didn't. And then you're like, well, if I if I complain enough, I can get what I want. <laughs> and yeah. like, I guess you can. <laughs> yeah, like, that that is the lesson here. Uh, just try a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there should. I mean, I remember when Justice League came out, how non-confident the executives were in that movie. The what should have been the biggest movie of all time. You have Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and the Flash. All these characters uh, has like one poster at the most obscure movie theater in your town that nobody visits, and that's the ad campaign for it. There's hardly any trailers. There's no billboards. There's nothing. All this fanfare for Avengers 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, nothing for Justice League. And that's because they knew they had... Yeah, with, with who? Hawkeyes putting asses in seats? Like, I don't believe yeah. that. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hawkeye's my favorite. Hawkeye's <laughs> <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> I, was, I was that weird kid that would buy the Namer the Submariner and the Hawkeye comic books. Were you in your backyard uh, with, like, your archery set with, like, a little, uh, <laughs> like, rubber yeah. sticky arrows? Nerf, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, at 25, yep. But the, I'll, I'll say that the hype around the Snyder Cut right now is much closer to what it should have been like back in 2017 when they were releasing the Joss Whedon version of this movie. Um, yeah. I'm excited for it. I don't know. I mean, this is kind of like case in point to, well, all these streaming movies are unremarkable. Well, now there's a lot of fanfare about this Justice League movie. So is that going to be the case with this one? I don't think so. Even if it's, even if it's oh. downright terrible, it's still going to be like a big moment when it drops. So they're not splitting it? It's just going to be one continuous four-hour movie then? Yep. Oh, just okay. like Gone with the they're not. Yeah. Do you know that they're not releasing it in Latin America? I mean, Why? I'm not going to pay for it. I don't know. I don't know if it's right. They're releasing it in like July or something over here. I mean, obviously I have it on my private thing oh the, the day after. movie theater but yes. <laughs> but yeah apparently they're not showing it over here i guess rights but that I, I mean i guess they just don't don't care about this audience because just like me you can just get it the next day for free on the internet there's, there's all this like it just feels like nobody could really fail like you could just try again really quick like suicide squad well that mm -hmm. was dog shit what if we make suicide squad yeah yes. it's better this time yeah. Just add a the in front of, and the everybody's title. just like, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, and John Cena's in it. Great. Oh, it's <laughs> this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> I, I I remember the days where if you made a mistake like that, you had to wait eight years for a new one to come out. Batman That's and Robin. The way it tanks. should be. <laughs> you have to. You you're, you know you're a brand new human being by the time that the next one arrives. I I, I wish that was the case now. Um, anyway. Killing of a Chinese bookie. What is what a film? Truly, uh, the best of the seventies, wouldn't you say, Hans? Yeah, best of seventy six. Should have won best picture above Cuckoo's Nest. I might actually. You know what? No, never mind. What? I was what gonna say, say I might like it. I might like it better than Cuckoo's Nest, but Ooh, I, don't I don't know, know about that. I don't want to say that publicly. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I I don't want to say that just because I've only seen it once. Uh, but that's true. I've really seen this movie twice, it. and I've seen Cuckoo's Nest like fucking eight times. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah. think Cuckoo's Nest is probably better. Just, <laughs> it's just my opinion. But uh, no, they're both very good. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if I'd even put it. The seventies is such a great era for movies. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if it would make my top ten for that decade necessarily. Killing of a Chinese Bookie, but I mean, it's pretty high. It's in high regard in general for me. 
what do you think is going to happen this year if things don't open up? Do you think they're just going to continue moving those big movies that are supposed to come out in theaters because of the money that they're supposed to get back and just move it to next year? Or is it going to just tenet it up and, and lose money? Uh, I think it depends on what the kind of movie is, right? So if it's something that's what's considered mid-budget now, like The Little Things or a Judas and the Black Messiah type film, that probably would have been released at the tail end of last year as Oscar bait. My guess is that they're going to come out because they don't want to sit on them any longer and potentially lose profit. They have to put something out because they took last year off. And they weren't able to film really anything new, I don't think, in that that time either. If it comes to Disney movies, they'll probably wait a year if, if it means releasing it in theaters. Or they will figure out a way to jack the price up on streaming and have people pay for that. I don't, I don't buy that 90 million people have Disney+. Plus. I just don't believe that at all. I don't believe any of their numbers. But at the same time, you have to consider that the game is no longer who's watching what and the amount of numbers that are watching that product or even signing up, it's tricking your investors. So if there's a lot of promise for whatever it is you have coming out and everybody around you who's giving you money believes that, then that matters more than what it's actually delivering. And that's how they wind up producing so much shit that nobody actually likes, or rather the majority of people aren't drawn to, that they don't find relatable at all, but they still churn this out uh, like it's the most popular thing, like it's you know sliced bread. Yeah, it feels like they kind of have to do what they didn't want to do last year. Or it's like, oh, we're going to hold off for a year. And then it's like, well, the year's up. And uh, year. <laughs> what do you want to do now? And they're like, ah, I guess we'll do it. I guess we'll let it all out. Fuck it. I well, don't know. Do you, think we'll, do you think we'll get Dune this year? Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think everything that's been slated for 2021 is going to come out this year. Dune, I mean, they, what they're doing, though, is they're walking back what they initially said, which was, it's all going to streaming, guys. It's all Actually, it's going to go to streaming for about 30 days. Actually, maybe not every movie will go to streaming. <laughs> and they're, at, there's going to have to come a point where they do, like, just fully embrace the, the theaters or those that are left anyway. Did that AMC yeah. stock fix anything for the movies? Did, are, 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 did that save movie theaters at all? I don't know. I lost a couple of hundred dollars believing that shit. I'm never doing <laughs> stocks again. I'm going to stick to crypto. That was a yeah. fucking waste. I hate those guys. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, uh, I just want my fucking Halloween. I want my Halloween every year. I want my new Halloween every single year, and they better stop fucking bumping those. Well, they just said today uh, that Halloween Kills might be doing a direct to streaming release this year, which would be, yeah, I think so. Which I, you can do that, but I feel like the appeal of the of any movie like that, of any slasher film, is seeing it in the movie theater. Yeah, yeah. hell yeah, the sound, not just oh, the picture, man. but the sound that you get there. You can't unless you have a very expensive, you know, sound system at home or a home theater or whatever. I have my laptop, even my TV fucking broke. So I like that's gonna suck if I have to watch that on a laptop. Uh, as much as I wasn't a huge fan of the last, the one from the year before, um, I don't want to watch that on my laptop. Yeah. Yeah, I need so. things to do. Like even if they're not that good, like fuck, let me let me be a little mad. Yeah. I just wasted my money on this fucking shit, and I have something yeah, yeah, to bitch yeah, yeah. about instead of just like nothing. Like I'd I'd rather like get my hopes up or something. Go out, go out into the world and get my hopes up. <laughs> right. <laughs> waste some money. Yeah. Uh, seems, I, I feel like the last year and a half has especially pointed out that as a culture, I think America relies way too heavily on convenience rather than experience. Uh, that's something that I noticed when I visited Japan is everything feels old. Everything feels like it's in the 90s. Like you can go to an arcade and they will be popular and people will yeah. still uh, buy and sell physical media at uh you know a, a crazy rate people buy cds over there so right, there's, right. there's cd stores everywhere insane i couldn't believe and my you could eyes just, you could just get on the ground and lick the floor because it's just the cleanest people <laughs> yes, in the world yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing is stolen nothing is dirty it's right. just this like yeah i got i mean fuck it's just I, a uh, well-behaved society 
It's yeah, the farthest buy, thing from America. Still buy music. Like uh, I, w- I went to uh, the last Tower Records in Tokyo, I think. Oh, I love that. That was, that, yeah, the Six Floors and it or was, something. It was nuts. It Insane. just felt like nuts, like a not a not real place, or like uh, something that, uh, I don't know, just never made it to America. Like that feeling of like just, I don't know, like a super a super mall feeling, but um, fun. Yeah, what are you, a weeb? Waxing poetic about Japan. For- <laughs> yeah. I think I. Yeah, what am, is that? Honestly. I, I try what to hide it, store, but goddamn. What does that store have that H and V does it? Or uh, what's another Best H&V. Buy? <laughs> what? What are you? What are you saying? Are you referencing like dead, dead markets from like 1997? H and V. What is that? This is the first CD store I could think of from wow. like North America. Yeah. You know my references are always yeah, timely. Yeah, and you just accurate. reminded us you're <laughs> almost forty now, Hans. Yeah, I've never heard of that place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, well. um, yeah. Uh, what else can be said about Casavetes? So just put a pin in the episode, Hans. Give us like a good, eloquent, just just a final note on the killing of a Chinese bookie. Uh, the killing of a Chinese bookie is the Irishman, but not boring. You thought the Irishman was boring? That's, that's I haven't finished it. You yet. haven't finished it? Like a, I'm Marty, like two hours in, and I did you see the Irishman? Like yeah, I did. What did you think about it? I loved it, but I I uh, fuck those like the only thing that really drove me crazy is uh when I see those CGI blood splatters, it drives me oh. fucking crazy, dude. I just think that they always look so whack, and like some of the about- shit look weird. But uh, overall, like I like the movie and everything, but just like those little things, like really rub me. Or De Niro's about kicking the, his the, weak, the, weak the, knee, yeah. his <laughs> old man knee, where he's like twenty five years old and he's supposed to beat the yeah, shit yeah, out of yeah, somebody, yeah. and he's just giving like a dainty kick to a man who's like ah ah ah, but it's like the weakest, the weakest kick to the he's ribs like, you've ever seen in film. He's an yeah, eighty year old in the supposedly body of a twenty five year old, but that was the end of that, book. right? That was the last like uh, <laughs> that was like the last team up of uh, the Goodfellas crew that we're gonna see, right? Uh, yeah, I think I think that's fair to say. I don't I, I don't see them doing anything. I mean, Joe Pesci doesn't seem interested in doing anything at all. He's he's pretty relaxed. He's pretty comfortable. Uh, I think that's the end. I don't even know if Scorsese. Look, Scorsese's very old. He's like he's got to be about eighty now, right? He's got the the DiCaprio serial killer film that's going to go to Apple that has a seventy five million dollar budget. Who knows if he's even going to survive that? To be honest with you, I mean, I'm sure he's very healthy, Scorsese. But Irishman, mm-hmm. uh, to me, feels like that's that's the end. So maybe even even if he does get this one out, I feel like Irishman is going to be looked at as the final Scorsese film, just because. It is the end of what he's been known for. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, just the. I don't know how to say it. The cycle of his movies, where it's you know like we had it good, we had it real <laughs> good, and then it was not so good. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, you just watched uh, everything collapse. Hans, are you looking forward to anything coming out this year? Uh, I can't really think of anything, to be honest, on the top of my head. There's so much. There's two years worth of films that are... How about Mass State Lottery? I'm hearing very good things about Mass State Lottery. I hear this is going to be the film of the year. I hear this is the best picture frontrunner, actually. That's what I've heard. I'm stoked. Yeah. I'm stoked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm excited about that one, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's it. <laughs> is, this your, is, this your acting, uh, is this your acting debut, Hans? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty... Pretty. I'm. I'm pretty nervous because of how nervous I was when we were shooting it, and I was like, every time I would fuck up a, a, a take, I would just be like, I'm gonna fuck this up. Like I'm just gonna see myself on screen, and it's gonna suck. Yeah. So that it sounds was like so nerve wracking. Yeah, so just fighting with myself in that and trying to deliver that. But because one of the things that I struggled with was my accent and trying to deliver those lines without having my accent. But uh, but you play a foreign a character. That's so it's it's okay to have an accent. I mean, here here's the truth about Hans. I'll give you he, what he's saying is correct. The first day he was extremely nervous. He was I mean, it's like 30 degrees out when we're filming. He's sweating. <laughs> he is profusely sweating. Uh, but luckily, here's the thing. As nervous as he was that first day, he still nailed it by the end of it. 
And then when we wrapped what we were doing, we still had a good day left over, a couple of days, like one or two days left over where we could just like reshoot shit. And we redid some of that scene. So, and he was fine. He was good. Did it get easier every day for you? Yeah. Well, I, I think just the, n- not just the, the delivering of the lines. I think we shot on the day that we got there. Mm-hmm. So I was exhausted in every way, you could mentally, physically, everything. And oh, then yeah. the pressure of, okay, we have 10 days here. I don't want to be the one that fucks this up, you know, so that. And then also, I'm never com- I've never been comfortable in front of a camera that I'm not holding. Yeah. So every, every time I've done that, even with friends back in college or whenever I've done that and someone else is recording it, I always get really nervous because I, I have a, a bit of a lot of stage fright. Um, so it was a lot of that. You so know, flying uh, that to a new country set. where you're on a plane for like yeah. 10 hours and then you're in front of three people you've only known online. And then we don't, we don't have filming permits. We're going to go act in a public place and see if we can pull this yeah. off. Uh, yeah, then and you then have to do I that was too. To, I was supposed to read the script on the plane, but I just fell asleep. <laughs> oh, oh my god! god. <laughs> so then I got there, and I was like, "Well, I guess we'll just won't shoot on the first day, and I'll just learn this for the next day." And then we get there, and it's like, "Okay, so we're shooting this." And I'm just like, "Fuck!" Like I now I have to learn this thing. So yeah, it was it was just a lot of of things. But like you said, like that first day was the roughest one, and then after that, I mean, I still had that thought of I don't want to fuck this up in the back of my head, but it did definitely got well, easier once once we became more comfortable with with each other. The first, yeah, the first day was a big problem for a couple of different reasons because not only were was Hans ill prepared to act, but we were ill prepared to live with one another because again we thought we were showing up to a one bedroom we've talked about this so much now we thought we were showing up to a one bedroom where we're gonna have two people in the bedroom uh one person on the floor one person in the bed one person on the couch one person on the floor no 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 it was a studio apartment and we were all in the same room and there's one little bathroom and that's what we had for 10 days so we had that and then nobody brought any food uh and nobody had blankets or pillows or anything like that so uh we go out to lunch and we drop like 70 dollars on like all right now let's head to the one bedroom apartment ah no we gotta go to walmart and buy everything we have to buy everything for the next 10 days we didn't do that either uh so we wound up getting like the bare minimum for the day and it's like all right now we have to go into boston and we have to go figure out a spot where we're going to shoot this and act and we're going to have the camera oh it's raining Okay. All right. Uh, we'll just uh, someone have like a jacket to put over the camera or something. All right. Yeah. Well, were you fucked with it all? Like, was anybody hit you with the like? Uh, where's the permits, buddy? Yeah. No, no. No. We didn't. We didn't have any issues. I don't think as far as that goes. The only no. problem was like a little Puerto Rican man came up to us and disturbed the. Sh- he was drunk as hell. He, we were filming right oh, by shit. the liquor store. He was just walking around <laughs> in circles. Um, that yeah. was the only time where he, uh, you know, where we had a problem at any point. And then it was well, just they, like delayed they, five minutes. Does that only happen want, in, like, like, New York and L.A.? Like, people, like, getting fucked for shit like that? Because, like, I can't imagine, in, you know, like, I can't imagine even in Chicago somebody being, like, a cop, like, interrupting or something. No, I mean, it, I, I've never had that happen where, like, a, a person who owns the property or a cop or anybody comes up and is like, hey, what are you doing? Get out of here. Uh, I, I've never had that happen before. Even in New York, I mean, most people... There's a lot of people shooting at all times of the day. People are used to seeing people out and about with cameras. So you don't even get like passersby that will look at you. Whereas I feel like that was probably the case when we were shooting in neighborhoods, people peeking out windows and stuff. If we're out late at night shooting on their block, you know, uh, it's not as yeah. common in Boston in the little suburban. You probably area. don't even have to use blanks in New York. Fuck, like nobody would even notice. <laughs> Well, we well we should we talk about is, it, is that legal to talk about where we're talking about getting uh, Jake to bring in something and uh, we we're just gonna do one take where it's an actual shot and then he decided a little not fire, to a little yeah. firearm thing. I, I I thought about I, I mean we wanted to do this and then we thought better of it or he thought better of it I still wanted to do it I was like so where's the where's the prop you know <laughs> and he was like yeah I didn't want to bring that on the plane with me I was like oh all right well. I guess we'll just get creative then. 
So yeah, I'm sure there's a but BB I gun think, at Walmart. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we were shooting at three in the morning too. You know, even oh. though we were shooting downtown, yeah, that's, that's a good point. A lot of it was a, like th- I don't have a license. I've never had a license, and I was driving downtown Boston at like yeah, three we broke a lot of laws for this. Uh, he was driving a car <laughs> around. Uh, I mean, this was in broad daylight too. It was like the middle of the day. Hans is driving a car for the first time in the United States. He's probably only <laughs> driven in the United Kingdom before, where it's the opposite side. You know. And no, uh, no not, not even, even then. Here. All right. So no, you have no experience no, no. driving a car ever in your life. And then, uh, you know, he had to bring the car back. He had to uh, back the car up. And so he did that at full speed going backwards in this little residential neighborhood. And we have it all on camera. You could go to prison. on. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he was fucking nervous. Putting him behind the wheel and shit like. No, and oh, then in one just... take. In, in one take, he's like, "Why don't I just improvise something funny?" And I'm just like, "Are you? Are <laughs> well, you really how you driving? <laughs> yeah. This could have been fucked up so much. It's a, it's, it's honestly a miracle that it's come out like swimmingly in, in, I mean, just in general when we were shooting it, but also in the edit, where just how fast and loose we had to play it sometimes. Not really had in that case, but chose to. Um, well, that's a, it. that's another thing that we never really had long setups or like a tripod outside for a long time or anything like that we we made sure that if we planned something we knew exactly what we were going to do so it would only take us you know a couple of minutes to shoot it and that's it and we'll just move on so i guess that's also a factor we never gave neighbors a, a chance to call the cops i guess or complain about it damn that but, sounds so exciting just like having a fucking plan and just like getting after it with like a group of people that are all on the same page and like it's like it's like a mission yes that's exactly what it was like I, i'm very grateful for everybody flying into boston to to do that especially you hans where you had to go across uh you know international lines essentially to film this movie it was a it was a very stressful but a very fun uh 10 days to be able to do that i did have to go home to my parents just to like deprogram my head a little bit because i you know if i don't make the days and we're fucked they all got to go back uh and i was just just gonna be very grumpy if i had to share and they were, all, with they were all still there they were all still there like ripping ass and like... oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah I, i've heard stories about you know what waitresses or whatever that you guys were, were meeting, yeah. like, paying to badmouth one of the guys or something i don't know waitresses that were there to bully jake because he looked young he had long hair Yes. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, literally yeah. it. Just a waitress that would get him against him. And uh, watching all sorts of uh, great films that I, I missed out on for for two of those nights anyway. Just because, again, very stressful having to meet all those days. Because once they're gone, they're gone. We can't do any reshoots. with. I mean, we can put Hans behind a green screen or something. That's going to look terrible. Your hair's not yeah. even the same. Yeah, that's the thing. Like that, I don't even have that anymore, and I don't think I can even grow it again. Oh, God. So, I, so don't say that. Yeah. Still, I need you to... <laughs> I, I still need Hans to like do one remote scene. Um, we'll get you a nice hat. We'll put that cabbie hat back on you. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that sounds fucking awesome. Yeah. I, I want to I get more projects going as soon as I'm done with this. I want I want to line up the next couple of you know, to have ready, ready to go. So that'll be, that'll be fun once I have this off my plate and hopefully uh, everyone can see it by the end of this year. Um, awesome. I'll be sure to send you a copy. This is going to be a big year for you musically, right? Yeah, I plan to um, release the most songs I've ever released in a year. And uh, hopefully some of them are, you know, my band, but uh I, I don't know. They're mainly like uh, probably just going to be me. And uh, I've been like learning how to record music myself. And uh, that's a whole like area that I've never really learned or gotten into. Mm-hmm. Like it was just whoever, whoever else in my band would be, you know, engineering the song or uh, just doing all just doing all the work, like besides me singing. So it's been like, it's been pretty cool to learn how to make a song by myself. And like, it's a, I don't know, super rewarding feeling. And I never really got around to just crafting a whole song alone before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's pretty cool and shit just moves way faster. We're like, I'm, I'm seeing that it's totally doable to put out two albums in a year 
Whereas before I was like, I would be like, that's fucking impossible. You know, just as far as when you're, when you're working with four other people and, uh, it's just, it's just not as easy. Yeah. And, uh, so that'll be cool. I mean, I've never done anything like really like this before. I've put out some, I've put out a few songs, you know, just by myself, but, um, this will be a full on like 10, 10 track album. Dope. And, uh, yeah, it sounds, it sounds strange, but hopefully some people like it. And, uh, I'm just going to keep making them. I don't know. I got nothing to do. Yeah. I, I, I'm excited to see what you, you wind up putting out. Um, you recently released, was it a vinyl for the, the Orwell's, uh, record that you, I think put out via YouTube last year or just, yeah, it's a, an extremely frustrated me uploaded it to YouTube one night <laughs> and I set the little timer for 10 a.m. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I'm going to be in such deep shit with my band. <laughs> when, when I wake up, everybody's going to be so mad. They're going to like physically come hunt me down. And, uh, and that day was one of the most stressful days of my life, but, uh, I don't regret it at all. And, uh, Every time somebody's like, yeah, I really like that record, I'm like, fucking great, because I had to pull a lot of strings against uh, other people's opinions to get that out. But uh, I'm glad I did. And uh, we got another one that is uh, pretty sweet, but um, trying to uh, figure out when that's going to come out. Because we're uh, suing a lot of people, and that takes a really long time. <laughs> nice. It takes, like, years. Like, if you're ever going to sue anybody, get ready for, like, three years of your life to be gone. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're doing in, in, in Banville. So that's very stressful. And, um, you know, it's just really, really fun to make stuff alone and, like, learn how to record. So... That's just what I'm doing to stay creative and stay productive. And uh, so probably put out two records this year and uh, hopefully just go, you know, quicker and quicker and get better at it until, you know, I could put out some steady content myself and uh, maybe try to make a living again. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very excited to see what you've got coming out this year and just to what you were saying before. Yeah, it, it is uh you know, such a you wind up saving a lot of time by just learning a lot of the technical aspects of what it takes to get a song out or, or, or do this or that. Like obviously I I I'm speaking from a filmmaking perspective, but not having to rely on like the wait times of other people to handle your business. Yeah. You know, it it is um I, I do find that much more rewarding than just like commissioning something. Yeah. Something I wish like I learned that. earlier, honestly, like I was fucking spoiled and I had to be forced into it. to like, listen, nobody's, nobody wants to fucking produce this or put this out. So I'm going to have to go online and figure out what I need to figure out how to put it together. And, uh, it's cool. Like I really love these songs that are come out hopefully at the end of the month or maybe right in the beginning of next month. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird how, it's weird how things, uh, get to the point of existing, but I'm fucking stoked about them. Awesome. So hopefully it'll be a big year for, for the three of us then. And hopefully all positive, positive results yeah. to come from. When yes, it comes please. Out. Oh boy. All right. Uh, we'll wrap up the show there since I'm holding my apartment hostage right now from my girlfriend. <laughs> So uh, am I. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, Hans, we already know where to follow you. It's Hans Memorial yeah. on Twitter, yeah. Hans and Dose. Patreon.com slash Lars. And where can people find your music and you, Mario? Uh, MC Mario Cuomo on Instagram. And I got one of those uh, nifty little link thingies, link tree, link tree, whatever the fuck it's called, where uh, you can click on all, you can buy my old clothes from thrift stores that I overpriced. You can <laughs> listen to my little songs that I make, and uh, I think you got my YouTube my YouTube channel on there where you can listen to all the music uh, from my band that I leaked and all the all that good stuff. Awesome! All right, it was great having you yet again on the show. 
Uh, we'll have to do this a third time. So I've already start thinking of an- another movie to cover for, for this program. Um, right on. That has been the episode for this week. Thank you for listening.